This is Bible Academy. Today we continue in our study in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 11, verse 17. Now before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins, or at the same time, we're allowing the Holy Spirit to control us so we can get the most out of our study. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and the time and the privilege and everything you've provided so we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. We continue in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let me show you our outline where we are on this. We begin another section. D, under 4, Abuse of the Lord's Supper, 11, 17 through 34. Now, this is a uh, rather long lesson. I'm going to try to get through it in one session, but I may not. I really don't want to keep the continuity on this, but if it's not possible to make it within a reasonable time, I won't. So that's kind of a warning. So I may move kind of fast through this just to get through material at the same time I want to make sure it's clear and uh, not too fast. Let's begin with an introduction. In verses 17 through 34, Paul returns to the subject of the Lord's Supper. He rebukes them for their conduct during this sacred ritual. Now, apparently there was a fellowship meal either during or after it. Now this is the time of Paul. Participants in this case, when this on this occasion uh, that this letter refers to, were not properly prepared, and they were conducting themselves irresponsibly. Now, there's a lot of application here because this goes on, I think, quite often. In this rebuke, Paul further teaches on the meaning of the Lord's Supper. You may recall back in verse 2, Paul had commended the Corinthians for doing some things right, now he goes to what they are doing wrong. He's not commending them, and he makes that point. Pretty strong one, verse 17. But in giving this instruction, I do not praise you, because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. Now this instruction that he's giving is this present instruction on the Lord's Supper and some related issues. They're assembling together were doing more harm than good, more tearing down than building up. Verse 18 begins to explain some ways they're doing harm. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part, I believe it. For in the first place, here's the first problem he's going to tackle. When you come together as a church, that's a situation when they're fully assembled. Paul writes, I hear that divisions. Now, understand this. This is not doctrinal divisions, differences over beliefs, but, or, or rather, I should also add to that false teachings or even heretical teachings. But it's divisions over social status between the rich and the poor, the haves and the have-nots, um, and those in between. People at the assembly came from all walks of life and all levels of social status and income. And they meet together as a church. But this has led to a lot of unnecessary and uncalled for divisions. They're dividing over their social status. That's just a word to cover all these differences. Church unity was lacking. You might say they had their cliques, but these were strong cliques. And by that I mean they don't go outside their cliques very much. Perhaps they look down on others, or they look up to some and say, uh, you're just a hooty tooty or something like that. You think you're better than everybody, and others will think, no, you're just worse. And that's not good. Here's the point. Rather than being united as a church body when they assembled, they were divided over social status. Verse 19 makes it more interesting. 
Paul further explains these divisions, but they're not exactly what it sounds like at first. For there must also be factions among you in order that those who are approved may have become evident among you. Notice when he says, for there must also be factions. Now, factions cannot be exactly equivalent to divisions because divisions is bad. Factions are necessary. These factions or divisions uh, just referenced to in verse 18 are necessary. So we have a connection, but they're not exactly the same. Let's talk about the factions from this, this point. Factions are part of nearly every church. There is the rich, there is the poor, there is the in-between that make up a church. This is normal. In fact, they are necessary. And this is a, Paul, a point that Paul is making. There must be factions. He doesn't say stop being divisive. He says there must be factions. So what you have here is the natural factions that grow into divisions. The natural factions are necessary. This is the design for a Christian assembly. Why? In order that those who are approved. Now let's talk about that phrase for a minute. Those who are approved are those who properly conduct themselves among other Christians of different social status. How do you treat the real poor? Let's say dirt poor, the bum type person off the street, hardly any good clothes, doesn't eat well, doesn't appear very good, might even have a certain odor. And then you have the other extreme who wouldn't go near them. So this is a test among all the Christians to see who are passing, that is, treating each other <clears throat> out of love, consideration, <clears throat> and respect, and who is not. So, out of legitimate factions of social status and differences grew illegitimate divisions with discrimination creating divisions. Now you see the connection. It's not wrong to have factions, but it's wrong to create divisions over them. That's an important point to recognize. In fact, it affects the whole interpretation of this passage, at least this section of verses. Factions over social divisions bring to the surface our attitudes towards each other. They bring out our prejudices and challenge us to make those adjustments in our lives. Genuine adjustments, not pretending to love them and then cut out and then uh, behind their backs when they leave, you run them down. That's not, that's not the right thing to do. Or when you get away from church, you say, you know those people, and then you go on about them. That's called hypocrisy. Factions among us shows who we are. Now that's just not in a uh, formal church setting, but in your everyday life, whoever you're around. But church brings all of these together, you see, at least an assembly. When they could have assemblies where there was enough positive people wanting the word and worship the God of the Bible, they could come together from all walks of life. Today, often churches are divided over similar social statuses. Uh, and that's, if that's not necessarily the case for, especially when you talk about a locale, yes, if you live in a, a good area of town where most people make pretty good money, you're liable to have mostly well-to-do, or at least better-to-do Christians than you would poor. Now, I myself, I, lived in a, I live in a mixed neighborhood. Uh, just a block away or probably the more poor but within my neighborhood it's it's just it's above that level but it's certainly not what I'd call rich okay so I know what it is to be among these different people at different times and uh, yes those who are uh, look better who who take care of themselves take care of the yards those to me uh, are really taking care of themselves and taking care of themselves and that shows a sign of respect and responsibility there are some though 
who may be poor, be just as clean as they can be and respectable as they can be. Don't misunderstand. It's not because of their social status. It's basically because, well, they're slobs. They don't want to work. And that can happen at all levels. The problem is you don't usually get in a good middle-class neighborhood by not wanting to work. Of course, the government giveaway programs are making that possible. But uh, I think you get my point. Here, those who make an issue out of one's social status fail the test. They're not approved. So this is a check on our Christian behavior. With that said, Paul applies this towards what is happening at the Lord's Supper among the Corinthians. And of all places, they should so show unity and love, uh, cooperation is at the Lord's Supper because of what it symbolizes. You wouldn't only be a hypocrite, you'd be a super hypocrite. And Paul kind of makes that point, and you'll, you'll see it in a moment. Verse 20 shows that their factions have negated the purpose of the Lord's Supper. This is what I just meant. Their factions have negated the purpose of the Lord's Supper. Verse 20 reads, Now when you come together at the same place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now right away, they'd probably react to that. Then what are we doing? Right? So to put it another way, when they gather for the Lord's Supper, that is not what they're doing. And that makes the point. That's the way Paul opens up this, opens this up. If you remember back in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, we saw Paul talk about the symbolism of the elements of the Lord's Supper, where there's a sharing of the blood of Christ and a sharing of the cup. And this sharing is not only with Christ, but also with other believers, demonstrating a unity among them. So it's a sacred ritual, a communion table. I usually call it the communion table, but you'll hear me in this lesson uh, call it the Lord's Supper. Uh, I don't, I don't want to mix terms, but sometimes you keep saying communion, you think there's going to be a good sharing, and there's not. So I'm just going to call it the Lord's Supper. And that is that ritual that Jesus began um, on the evening before his arrest and crucifixion. But it's a sacred ritual where we share, where we share the fellowship with Christ and with each other. With each other. But this is not what's going on among the Corinthians. In fact, their conduct is nullifying a major part of the Lord's Supper. So it end up it ends up becoming because of the hypocrisy and the playing games and the mistreatment, though they go through the ritual movements, eat the bread, drink the cup, it's empty because they've voided it of its meaning. So when Paul says, verse 20 again, now when you come together to the same place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. So they're not doing what they were supposed to come to. It's not the Lord's Supper. It's not like the Lord's Supper, what they're doing. And he explains this in two ways. Two ways they're negating it. Verse 21, For in your eating, each one takes his own meal first, and one is hungry, another is drunk. This may seem a little confusing to you because on one hand we're talking about the Lord's Supper and we're all talking about eating a meal. And they were separate events and not the same events, but they could be at the same time, but they were certainly distinct. Here's some background. And it appears that the church has a regular fellowship meal as a church, which is fine. That's a good thing for churches. I have no problem with that. I've participated in them. Uh, especially by the eating part. And uh, you also have a communion. Now the communion may have taken place during it. I doubt that. I think most people would prefer to take the ritual elements afterward, after it. Okay. Maybe some before. I don't know. I just There's no law on this. There's no strict rule. It gets a little confusing when you want to, you want to add them together. But we'll sort this out a little bit as we move on. But it was during these meals, this is the fellowship meal, that's, I'm going to distinguish it between that and the Lord's Supper. It was during this fellowship meal that these prejudices surf surfaced. 
He goes on to say, For in your eating, each one takes his own meal first. And that's just what it says. So when they have their fellowship meal, they're not even eating together. Have you ever been at one of those dinners where you're supposed to eat together as a fellowship and some people get there early and some people get there late and the people who got there early are already done eating and put up their plates and sitting there and the other ones just now come in? Well, this is something like that. It almost sounds like a first-come, first-served basis. I'm not sure how that was, but the point is there are some who are not waiting and some not even getting food. So Paul goes on to describe, let me put the scripture back up there, and one is hungry. Some of you get hungry. So they don't get there in time, or they don't get to the food in time, or they don't get to have the food in time, but they don't get to eat. And the point is they get little or no food. Then the last one may surprise you, and another's drunk. So this is a person who's probably been drinking before he gets there, drinks too much when he's there, and he passes the limit, you might say, and now he's in the area of drunkenness at this fellowship dinner. And this may carry right over into the Lord's Supper, where he still hasn't got his wits about him. He hasn't sewed up, as we say. And there still are people sitting there hungry. And now all the food's gone. Now, certainly, drunkenness is a sin. Drinking's not. And they did drink uh, alcohol, alcoholic wine. In those days, it was typical. Jews would do it too. Jesus would do it too. But they wouldn't imbibe to the point where they got drunk, especially those Christians who wanted to stay in the Lord's will. Of course, Jesus would never been drunk. But the point is, if you drink too much wine, you can get too inebriated. Or get inebriated. Simply put, when it comes down to it, these people are not treating each other right and uh, misbehaving. This shows there's no consideration and certainly no unity. And as you recall, that is a fundamental manifestation of the Lord's Supper. So then, in come the divisions. In verse 22, Paul continues to explain with some rhetorical questions. By now you know he likes to use those questions. They seem to be effective to his audience. They raise questions where they should know the answer. Rhetorical questions basically saying a statement. Doesn't expect uh, really a, an answer as much as just, yes, that's right. Here it is. Verse 22, do you not have houses so that you can eat and drink? Well, of course they do. He's making that point. Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? Well, unfortunately, that's what some of them are doing. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? And this, I will not praise you. He begins by saying, do you not have houses so that you can eat and drink? As I said, of course they do. Then why are they being this way? The next rhetorical question is a two-parter. Or do you despise the church of God? Now, that's a pretty strong rebuke. Despise here means to think little of or think nothing of, to look down on, treat with contempt, even scorn. Think of what the poor and hungry thought who didn't get to eat, who knew that unity was important. Here's an opportunity for them finally to get a good meal and they get there and the food's gone. Maybe the people who had food and, and uh, knew it was a good idea, they got there really early, perhaps started early. I remember one time we as a family were going to go to a, we were on vacation. And part of our vacation, it began with going to an, uh, a place up in California where you can go out to an island, but you had to catch the boat. And we got there on time. But just as we pulled up into the parking lot, the ship had pulled away. So they left early, which didn't take make us very happy because we had driven there, I don't know how long, it was probably two or three hours, just to get to this place, and they'd already left because they decided to leave early. Well, see, this type of thing that's happening here at this dinner, they're leaving early. They're eating early or 
without everybody getting there. And there's no reason to think that couldn't have been Percival, uh, excuse me, uh, couldn't have been uh, purposeful. I'm trying to say two words at once, sometimes that happens. So think of what the poor and hungry thought. Think of what those who see the drunks thought. He goes on to say, and shame those who have nothing. All that contempt and shameful behavior, the thinking that comes from that carries over into the communion or rather the Lord's Supper. Paul says, what shall I say to you? Well, think about it. What can he say? Shall I praise you? Paul's answered his own question. In this, I will not praise you. So what the Corinthians are doing is far from commendable. In fact, it is destructive to a church, especially its unified purpose. And the church is to be unified not even not during the communion, all the time. And then there are some who are in such condition they can't even focus on the communion or the Lord's Supper. Some are probably thinking how hungry they are, maybe resentful of those who got there early and ate, no food left. And then there's the drunks who are not thinking clearly at all. So the unity is missing. The love is missing. The consideration is missing. A lot of people don't think of it this way. When you get drunk in front of people and you have a, and you misbehave and you talk a certain way or you try, you crack the dirty jokes, or whatever, uh, that makes a lot of people uncomfortable. Oh yeah, you may be having a ball. But a lot of people want you to get away or they want to get away, unless they're doing it too. And then who cares? You see. Well, hopefully you haven't experienced that. In verses twenty-three and twenty-four, Paul began to discuss in detail the Lord's Supper then exhorts them to do it worthily, closing with judgment for those who do not. So it's pretty heavy terminology here. In verse 23, Paul begins to describe what Jesus did at the first Lord's Supper to show how their behavior is disgraceful. So he's going to use Jesus as the example or the model at the same time, teach from what Jesus was saying. Verse 23, Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. Now let's just stop there. The word for begins to explain why they are disgraceful and shameful as he explains the supper. He says, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. Paul is giving them the tradition, the way it is supposed to be. Did Paul receive this uh, from divine revelation? Or is he referring to an account from others on what Jesus did that evening? And they are so-called, uh, we might say, spiritual, spiritual enough to know he knows it's accurate. It's hard to say. Whether this is passed on or something he had heard himself directly from the Lord in a revelation. The point is, he did get the tradition and he's passing it on. Now listen, the information we're going to see here is not written to establish a strict liturgy to be completely followed in a certain way. And if you have been to a number of churches and seen the communion, some of them are different. Uh, some of them have them maybe with a meal. Some of them have them after the service. That's usually been my experience. On certain nights of the week, during the month, and that type of thing, some like to have communion more often or less often. Or may do it a little bit different. Now, there should be basic elements there. Don't misunderstand. Otherwise, you're not really uh, fulfilling the purpose. And Paul's not given a detailed description of how it should be in the church. In fact, if you compare the Gospels and this passage, you will see several differences. But all do have some certain common components. Now let me just put those on there for you to compare the Gospels. I think this is what you'll 
come up with two, as well as what Paul says. One, there's a taking of the bread. Two, there's giving thanks. Three, there's a breaking of it. Four, there's a word about the body, about the cup, and then word about blood and covenant. Now that's said, or what's exactly said, varies. So I'm trying to get you to understand, this is not a precise liturgy set in stone by Jesus. Because he didn't uh, say it in a way that they had to do it, and the gospel writers, or Paul did not write as if this is exactly how to do it, do it. This is exactly the way you do it. You can have flexibility. After all, most people uh, don't have wine, as far as I know. They use some sort of grape juice. Uh, and a lot of people don't use bread. They use little those little crackers. Okay. Uh, uh, when we have it, we have it actually with uh, bread. You know, like you'd buy in the store, a loaf of bread, and break that up. That's the way we do it. But all elements... These elements should be in the sharing of fellowship, and it should be unified. Now, that's part of it, too, the fellowship and unified. Well, Paul begins the account. By that, I mean he begins to say what Jesus did. Here we go. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. Paul points out that Jesus was also betrayed that same night, which adds a further solemnity to this event. It tells us more what went on besides just this supper that evening. Now, this is such a contrast to what the Corinthians are doing. They can't even hardly start the Lord's Supper without coming with bad attitudes. So it's already messed up. Now, another thing. Remember this first ritual was either after a meal or during it. So the next question is, if this was during the Passover meal, now this was the evening of the Passover, it seems that it is, though not all scholars agree, by the way, but whether it was the Passover meal or not, and I think it was, there is symbolism related to that also, that is the Passover meal. Uh, there's some connection, like the body of Jesus as the Passover lamb, but that hasn't happened yet. But now we know that the bread represents his body. But when they did this, it was the regular Passover. But during the Passover, they part of the drinking and the uh, the uh, you might say, a celebration of the Passover, recalling it, what happened uh, when they were released from Egypt, is drinking of cups. And they had four cups during this meal. So some interval they would drink a cup. I'm not sure if they would drink the whole thing or a big sip or whatever. The point is they separated these different times and I might say uh, acts of drinking from the cup. So first of all, understand, this is a special meal. That's in the background. It's the Passover meal. And the way it's related to Jesus is that he's the Passover lamb. But let's just leave that part right there for a moment. Let's go on to verse 24. Verse 24, Jesus discusses the breaking of the bread. Verse 24. So Jesus is taking the bread... And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now this is the taking of the first element. The Lord begins by giving thanks and breaking the bread. And he says, This is my body, which is for you. Now the first point here I want to make is obvious. When Jesus says, This is my body, it was not his real physical body. He was sitting there. Neither does it become Christ's body and blood, as the Roman Catholics claim at their consecration. I don't know if you knew that or not, but they actually claim that when you eat the bread, 
that you're eating the body and blood of Christ. Yes, they do. That's called transubstanti transubstantiation. Let me try that again. Transubstantiation there. What we see here is that the bread is symbolic of Christ's body as a sacrifice that will soon be given on the cross. He goes on to say, which is for you. The body, the sacrifice is given for us, all of us in fact. This indicates substitution. The bread substitutes for the body, and Christ's body helped provide a substitutionary atonement. In other words, he took our place. He took on our penalty. Listen to Galatians 2.20. Actually, let's put Galatians 2.20 with two other verses in Galatians, but they're not in sequence. 2.20 reads, Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ, and I live no longer, but Christ lives in me. And which life I live now in the flesh, that is the body, I live by faith, which is of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So when he talks about, but Christ lives in me, I live in, the, in my own flesh, I live by faith, he goes on to say, I live by faith, which is of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul demonstrates through these words the intimacy, the closeness. Look at the first line again. I have been crucified with Christ. There's identifying with Christ. So when you take this bread, you're identifying with his body. You're identifying with Christ. Verse 13 Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. There's substitute again. For it is written, Curses is everyone who is hung on a tree, in order that the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And what you see here is this identity with uh, Christ's crucifixion. In other words, you were there, so to speak. And you're also redeemed from the curse because he became a curse for you. He was your substitute. Now, let's go back to this related to the Passover. Let me make this clear. The communion is not the Passover meal. All right? I mean today. Yes, I think the first one was held during the Passover meal, but the communion did not replace it. It did not become it. No scripture for that. In fact, it teaches the opposite. It teaches Christ is our Passover. He's the sacrifice in our place. And this first supper, look forward to that. We look back to what he had done. So the Passover pictured Jesus' ultimate work. And that work is finished. Luke 12, 50, compare that with John 19, 30. Important passage. Remember also the Passover was an Old Testament practice. And that disappeared as the new covenant came in. And again, remember the Passover. Well, not only was it an Old Testament practice, but it was signifying, it was a reminder of where the, new, the old covenant came from. They started out as a nation coming out from the uh, well, let's put it this way. They came out free from the Egypt Egyptians. So it points back to when that Passover, when that uh, death angel passed through while they were inside eating the meal with the blood on their doorpost, being safe. And they look back to that. It's a big event in the history of Israel. But now Jesus, now this is what makes it interesting. He introduces this cup during the Passover meal, which to me it shows a transition. And then we move into just the cup without the Passover meal as history progresses. Verse 24, let me continue with that verse. Finally, he says, do this in remembrance of me. 
This makes the supper a memorial. The supper is recalling a reflective time and we remember what Jesus did on our behalf. It's also a participation that pictures our sharing in the person of Christ on the cross. It looks back to what he had accomplished. And when we partake of the bread and cup, we demonstrate in a real experience the sharing of our faith with others who make the same confession. We have a united confession with the work and the, our Lord himself in our fellowship with him and each other. We confess his work on our behalf. Well, that was just the bread. Let's go on. Verse 25, the Lord's Supper continues with the cup. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So it begins in the same way he took the cup also. And I inserted he took because it's not in the Greek, but it's implied. It also says, after supper. So Paul takes the cup after the supper. Luke says, after they had eaten. This is in 2220. Luke 2220. So after the meal is when they took the cup. So, the fact that it was after the meal, that actually coincides with the traditional Passover meal, which formerly took four cups. This would have been the third cup, what they called the cup of blessing, which concluded the main meal. The bread would have come with the main meal after the second cup. So, from all appearances, it appears that this is, this is coordinated with the actual Passover meal. But you see, since the Passover meal is gone, it's not that we can't have a fellowship meal today. Don't misunderstand. But that's not the Passover meal. Because we don't celebrate the Passover in that way. That's Old Covenant stuff. Jesus goes on to say, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This is full of meaning. The new covenant is what we live under now rather than the Old Covenant. I've talked about that many times on many series. That's the old Mosaic covenant or the law. The new covenant was predicted in the Old Testament, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Also talks about it in, the he in Hebrews 8 through 10. Well, it's one of the main passages about the new covenant. It explains some of the differences between the old and the new. Now, of course, one of the main elements of the new covenant today is the indwelling Holy Spirit. That's one of the main parts of the new covenant. And what's going on here? When Jesus does this uh, special recognition, what we call the Lord's Supper, the change between covenants is beginning to take place. The cup anticipates the actual inauguration of the covenant with the blood of Christ. Now let me talk about this. I've used the word inauguration as uh, I think actually referring to it as the communion table. But let me, let me tell you how these tie together. So here's Jesus talking about the new covenant and his blood. It says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. The content of the cup represented, uh, which would be wine, represented the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ represented his death on the cross. So we, the, uh, the cup is a metonymy for the content, which is the wine, which represented the blood of Christ. So we have these different uh, things going on at the same time. So we have the cup, actually the content representing the blood, which represents the work of Christ, including his death on the cross. And this is a foundational principle to the new covenant. All right, what I mean by that is the blood of Christ is a foundational principle to the new covenant. So you see a transition 
the work of Christ had to happen in order to bring in the new covenant, called a better covenant, which provides a new way of life for the believer. Hebrews 8, 6, important passage. So what we have here, when I call it the inauguration, I kind of wrapped them together in the past, though I didn't really think about it that much, but really, Jesus recognizes at the supper what's going to happen the next day. So you might say he's starting to, you've seen him break those champagne bottles over the front of the ship, then that hits it, and the ship is finally released down to the water. This is kind of like he's getting the, he's getting the bottle ready to take the whack. And then he hits it, which would be parallel to Christ's death on the cross. So I, I've been picturing, I guess I still do, as all one inauguration. But, uh, And they were just, you know, less than what, maybe, uh, let's see, depending exactly when this was, but it was probably around 12 hours apart. So I use the word inauguration. That's my idea. And then again, we have this final phrase. I'll just read it this time. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So here's the point about the cup. I'll put it on there, on the board. The cup represents the new covenant actually inaugurated by the work of Christ. Verse 26. Verse 26 explains the significance of the supper. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Eating the supper is a proclamation of the Lord's death. It is a visible practice that testifies to the death of Christ. Taking the elements, look back to his death as we reflect on the meaning of the elements. The breaking of the bread and drinking the cup. We are to do it at regular intervals. He says, whenever you eat, as it be expected. Now, it doesn't tell us if it's supposed to be every week or every month. It doesn't say. But regularly, when you assemble together, when you come together to worship. And it's to be done until his return. So this taking of the cup, this ritual, also anticipates the future. And when Jesus comes back, we don't do it again. We don't do it anymore. So it's clearly a ritual, ritual to be continued up till the second advent of Christ. Then the reality is here. Now, verse 27 shifts to a warning of what happens to a person who partakes of the supper unworthily. Verse 27 reads, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, he shall be, get, he shall be guilty of the body and blood of the, of the Lord. Therefore means we're coming to a conclusion and an application. It begins, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. That is, the improper attitude and conduct. Now, this means to not take the supper seriously with a heart not focused, or as the Corinthians, selfish. Uh, selfish in attitude and conduct towards others. They were not fulfilling the basic requirements and purpose of the supper, that is, to reflect upon the personal work of Christ. Their hearts were full of other things as their conduct indicated. In effect, they were guilty of trivializing the supper is not that important, rather than a time of sacred reflection on the Lord's death. So to be guilty of the body and blood of Christ is to partake of the sacred ritual with social divisions, bad attitudes, and improper conduct. We go on, therefore, before one comes to the table, verse 28, but let a man examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. The word for examine here, let me just show that to you. Dokimazo is a fairly common term. It means test, proof, critical examination to determine whether genuine or not. And notice, he examines himself. In other words, 
I like to say it's an attitude check. You do a self-examination before taking the supper. That's essential. Don't mess that. Are you in fellowship with the Lord? Is your attitude right towards others? Remember that sharing with others is part of the meal, part of the supper. And this, this uh, examination often includes confession of sin, a time of prayer, to make sure you're right with the Lord. I often, I should say, I always do that before we begin the communion table or Lord's Supper. I usually call it the communion table when, when I'm actually doing it, but it doesn't make any difference. Same thing. Uh, we make sure we confess. Even though we just finished a church service, maybe something's happened come, come up in between the two events. It depends on your setting and other situations where there could be time for something like that. But the point is, you make sure you're ready to take it. You make sure your attitude's right. And if it involves confession of sin, do that. Verse 29, 29 goes into some detail of why we do this self-examination. Verse 29, for anyone who drinks, eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. The word for discerning, let me put that up there. There's another key word. Diacrino, sort out and think through. All right, that's the idea. Now, what are they thinking through here? What this means. First word, discerning the body. Discerning the body. Now, notice he just uses the term body. Now, this is an elliptical term. By that I mean it's a concise term that's including both the bread and the cup. Uh, we might use the term uh, uh, without discerning what's going on during the Lord's Supper, something like that. We can extend it, you see. But the body actually represents the whole act of the Lord's Supper, both elements, what you're supposed to be doing. Because of his lack of seriousness of the supper and the importance of having the right attitude, he, notice, eats and drinks judgment on himself. He brings on himself divine discipline. God will punish his child for not properly recognizing the sacred time of remembering his son's sacrifice on the cross. Verse 30 gives the results. Results of some of the divine discipline. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. There's actually a progression here. Being weak, some sort of disease, you're limited in your activity, you're sluggish, you're very tired. The next level is you're really sick. It's like having to stay in bed. Physically destructive. You are falling apart. The last one, have died actual physical death. Now it's interesting, this word for death is something we find in the Bible, especially referring to Christians. Uh, the word is kama'o. Kama'o. Uh, K-O-I-M-A-O. It actually means fall asleep. And that is metaphorical for Christian death. It's only seen as temporary. So here's the point, verse 30. I'll put it up there. The reason many are weak, very sick, and have died is because they did not partake of the Lord's Supper of a or of worthy manner. I might say worthily. And the Lord will not allow the Lord's Supper to be violated, especially by his own children. He protects its sacredness. And that happens by us not taking it lightly. In other words, if we take it lightly, we can be disciplined. When I give the Lord's Supper, I usually say something like, it is the most sacred time of worship when we remember the person and work of Christ and then allow for a time of prayer. 
That's my way. It doesn't have to be everybody's way. Though I would suggest everyone needs to get themselves right with the Lord. So whatever routine you do to do that. Verse 31, he goes on, talking about, remember, examination. But if we judged ourselves truly, accurately, honestly, we would not be judged. This time, the word for judgment, this is the one we saw earlier, diacrino, to differentiate, discern, evaluate. So it's self-evaluation here, being totally honest with yourself. So the result is, when you're totally honest, you examine yourself, you deal with it, make yourself right, we would not be judged. The word is crino this time. Without the D-I-A, as it looks in English, it also looks that way in Greek. Determine, that's the idea. It's a similar word to judge. So and you'll have some of your translations. So I put it up here because uh, you're basically kind of saying the same thing here, though they're different words. Uh, judge for both of them is fine. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. Point is, if we self-evaluate ourselves honestly, make the necessary corrections, we will not be judged. We won't be disciplined. So, verse 20, 32 gives us God's preventive measure. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Now, the preventive measure is to make sure you're not condemned with the rest of the world. First note, the words disciplined and condemned. The believer is disciplined by the Lord so he will not be condemned like the rest of the world. And there's a big difference. And here it is. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined. As Christians, you are disciplined. Now, the word discipline includes the idea of instruction. God, God is telling us something like, get right with him and do whatever it takes to do so. The Lord God will discipline us as a family member, as his own child. And he's merciful, which means we deserve a lot more. But understand this. This discipline, divine discipline, can be very severe, as we just saw. Beyond weakness uh, and even debilitating physical illness, even to death, don't abuse the Lord's Supper. However, if the Lord did not do this, he did not discipline you, we may fall back completely into the world, get away from the Lord, even apostatize and be condemned. Far better to be disciplined by the Lord than condemned along with the world. So when God judges believers for their abuse of the Lord's Supper, he's trying to warn them, keep them from condemnation. Verses 33 through 34 closes with some corrective instruction. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. Remember, this is the fellowship meal that they had back then, which probably preceded the supper. The fellowship time is a time of sharing with others, not creating divisions. Be considerate of others. Look, notice it says, wait for each other. Well, this is a long-term preventive measure to prevent yourself from receiving divine discipline. So wait for each other. Don't selfishly eat. Don't go in there with that attitude and also maybe create some other bad attitudes. Verse 34 is the final corrective, another preventive measure. So listen to this one. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it won't be for judgment. About the other matters, I will give an directions when I come. Now notice how he jumps from uh, if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. And then he says, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. In other words, if you come in hungry and you're selfish and you eat leaving everybody behind, you're setting yourself up for judgment. So how does he stop that? He wants people to stop that. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. If someone is so hungry that he cannot control himself to wait and share the fellowship meal, then eat at home first. Verse 
It's that simple. The purpose, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. So this is a preventive measure from getting yourself in a situation where you're going to get there and you're going to be so hungry. And I think all of us have probably been hungry if know what this means. That you want to be first. Paul is writing, better to stay home. Then go to the me and eat, and then go to the fellowship meal and demonstrate uh, considerateness of others. If you're so hungry and you go to the fellowship meal and are selfish, then you get yourself judged. Now, a common vulnerability is when one is really hungry to grab as much as you can as fast as you can. This helps prevent that. And Paul closes about the matters I will give directions when I come. The other matters. About the other matters, I will give directions when I come. So Paul closes. Let me put the verse back up. That he will cover other matters when he gets there. Now that seems to mean that there's a lot more to be dealt with, but Paul would rather deal, deal with them when he gets in their presence. Well, that ends that section. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for these challenging words. We thank you that you have given to us detail through these writings of how to conduct ourselves during the Lord's Supper. Challenge us with these things. In Jesus' name, amen.